This is your main man, Andrew Wood. Now, today we'll be coming live to you from Google Plus Hangouts. In the Hangout, I have the creator of the world-famous Vampire the Masquerade, a man that should need no introduction to any of you that know anything at all about gaming, uh, the legendary Mark Ryan Hagen. And I would like to thank you, Mark, for coming here and being part of your main man speaks. Today, we're going to start off talking about something that's very interesting, something that maybe not all of you have heard about just yet, but you need to. And you need to check it out. And what we're going to start with is we're going to be talking about Succubus the Reborn, the newest game from Make Believe Games, Mark Ryan Hagen's company. That's right. He's still putting out material that's as fresh and innovative as Vampire the Masquerade was. Uh, this game, it's... A very different, interesting, unique sort of game. It combines a card game aspect for a different sort of role playing experience. Perfect for any sort of party. You can have up to 90 people playing this game, and <laughs> of course, much, much, much less. So it's, it's a really interesting game. And I'd really like for you to kind of start off right now, Mark, if you wouldn't mind telling the people that are watching, telling the people that are going to be watching a little bit about Succubus the Reborn. Well, um, you know, uh, I really like uh, love role playing, and uh, uh, but one thing about role playing, which I think has kind of hurt it over the years, is it's kind of uh, hard to get into. You know, uh, there's a lot of rules to learn. There's a lot of sort of, sort of stuff about it that some people find a little strange, and uh, uh, and it's just um, you know, uh, the the people who get into it deeply love all the rules and stuff, but. But if you want to get someone new into it, they're pretty much frightened when you show them your stack of books, right? right. I mean, I'm sure everyone's had that experience. Someone walks into your library, your office, you go, and you, and you show them your line of books, and they're like, oh, my God, to read all that? And you're like, no, 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 you don't have to read all of it. I'll, I'll, I'll help you. And they're like, no, thanks. I'm not doing this. And so it's always been in the back of my mind, like, how do you introduce role playing? And uh, as part of my uh, work here in Georgia, I was helping uh, – run a local TV station, uh, and uh, we did a Mafia TV show. And I don't know if everyone's familiar with Mafia, or it's also known as Werewolf, but it's a, it's a game invented in the Soviet Union, and everyone loves this game in Georgia. Um, there's a play, a wink version, where you don't close your eyes, and they play groups of like 30, 40 people playing Mafia. It's amazing, and everyone's shouting and screaming, and I just love this game. And so uh, it got me thinking, how do you do this in a fun, cool way? And so this idea came to me of, of basically um, you start with five basically playing cards and you trade them. You trade with other players trying to get the best poker hand for your team. Uh, and uh, basically this is one way, this is one card game where, you know, royal flushes are not that rare. <laughs> We've even seen games, big games, where there have been two royal flushes, and you have to go to the second hand of cards. Anyway, it's just a really fun, fast, easy-to-learn game. Um, you have a captain's table. There's three acts, and it's just a way to, um, I don't know. I, I can't really, it's hard to describe the game because I don't think there's anything like it. It's, it's, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, explaining role-playing game to someone who's never role-played before. It's kind of hard, right? You kind of got to do it. Uh, I think Succubus is a little bit like that. But but it's definitely designed to sort of uh, help convince people to play a game because, you know, someone comes to your house, you have a party, you put five cards in their hand, and you say, this is your team, try and get a good poker hand, trade cards. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to learn, you know? For all of those of you who would like to get involved in this game, the Kickstarter is up right now. I put the link yesterday on my Facebook page. Once this interview is done, I'm going to put the link below for those of you who are watching it. And, you know, the days to come, make sure you keep getting on there. The Kickstarter will be up for a while. You want to support this game, support uh, this revolutionary idea in such a simplistic form, just a small window to get so many more people in to think about the fact you're at a party it's not a stressful environment they don't need to read lots of rules and it's just role playing it's just getting there and it's to various levels various degrees of comfort and it's about having that that fun experience <clears throat> it's not about you know those huge sets of rules and so forth so I think yeah, if they want to role play they can role play but we uh, our, one of our last play tests we had uh, so half the crowd was into role playing 
Another half of the crowd was completely not interested in role playing, but but they both groups interacted anyway, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and had a lot of fun doing it. You know, sort of. Uh, there's a lot of conniving. There's a lot of human psychology. There's a lot of uh, guesswork. Um, the cards have uh, hidden symbols of hammer, paper, scissor, bomb on them. So when you challenge someone, if they don't want to do a trade, you can challenge them and force them to do a trade. And so you got to win the hammer, paper, scissors, bomb. Uh, 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 that's, that, so that's, that's, a, that's a little complication. Yeah, and that's not something that's particularly difficult to learn. So then, like you're saying, you got half the group role-playing and half the group maybe, maybe they don't know about role-playing. So maybe not yeah. all those people come over, but you probably are going to get a few people go, oh, what were you guys doing? That added the game, that made the game better, made the game more fun. Let me let me learn more about this. And then, you know, you have already started the gateway, which is, you know. Yeah. Cool. Yep. And this is also a strange game in that because it's all about trading and challenging and working as a team, uh, it's actually better with more people. You know, eight people works great, two people on a team, no problem. But once you get up to, like, 12 or, or 16, then then it really starts humming. It, 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 and uh, when you get the more uh, larger groups, it's just so insanely chaotic in a fun way. You know, For, uh, 40 people all yelling and screaming at the same time. It, it's, it's pretty cool. Now, I have seen the face card of Mark Reinhagen, and from my understanding, there's a way that the fans of RPGs, the fans of this product, can get involved and even get uh, their own face cards made. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, my wife is completely distracting me. She sure. wants to do this. I, I was, I was saying, close the door, please. I was saying that I have remembered you show me the face card of yourself, um, and I believe oh, you yeah, yeah. people could get their own face cards made. Uh, is if they can make part of here's, here's my wife actually, and yeah, you can get your own face cards made, and uh, um, you know, become immortalized or your characters, which I think is a lot of fun. Uh, have your character immortalized. It's uh, it's actually fairly cheap for this quality of art um, to have something done, and uh, you get an art print and a, a full set of the game. Um, for like 500 bucks, so I think I think it's a pretty good deal actually, and it's selling out fast. So fortunately, you're right now. If you're listening to this, you're still able to get involved with that, and that's something you're not going to want to wait on for too much time. The Kickstarter started yesterday, so you're going to want to get moving on that as quickly as possible. Now, Mark, I also would like to ask you: uh, is, there, is there anything else that well, well before we move on, anything else about Succubus? the reborn that you'd like to share with the people that you'd like to give the people a tease of before we move on to our next topic here? Yeah, I, I, you know, just, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, it's, it's one of these uh, uh, games, I think it's just a, a great uh, entry-level game. I'm really obsessed with uh, gateway games. Uh, and, and But it just always has struck me that some of the gateway games, like Ticket to Ride or, or Carcassonne, are still kind of complicated. Um, you know, and uh, they're not really a party game. Or they're a party game and they don't have any strategy to them. Like Apples to Apples is a fantastic game, but it doesn't have any strategy or wheeling, dealing, or negotiation to it. And so for me, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of flat. I get bored of it pretty quickly. And so my obsession is with these games, like, just like my democracy board game, which is playable up to 15 players, I'm really obsessed with these massively multiplayer board games or par uh, party games where you can have all these different people together and their strategy, where, where uh, you know, it's actually a real game. So, so minimalist rules, literally, uh, you know, no one has to know the rules except the one person who's playing the dealer, and they just read aloud key sections that are highlighted, and that's it. People, it's so simple to play, yet... But there's so much negotiation and strategy that it appeals to me, who's the hardcore gamer. And then you add in, of course, the fact that I'm a hardcore role player. I <laughs> get to role play as well as be do strategy, you know. And that for me is is, is awesome. It's, it's it's just a lot of fun because so many live action games, you are negotiating and doing strategy, but in the end, it's all kind of nebulous. There's no actual hardcore rules you're arguing over. You're kind of just sort of role-playing it out and kind of it's give and take. But in this game, you're actually negotiating over cards. 
You know, you're saying, I want that Joker card, and I will give you this and this. I will do this for you. I'll trade you this. I'll go help you with that guy. I'll do this. You know, uh, it's it's a real thing. And uh, and for me, that's what makes a game is when is when uh, me wheeling and dealing and uh, and all that sort of feels real. I love that. I think that really sets you up thematically well, Mark, with the types of creatures that you're dealing with with the vampires, with the infernal sort of theme that you have to this game. The underlying of that, what you said, wheeling and dealing, that trading and attempting to, like you said, force people to make the trades to acquire what you need. And I, I think that that is very thematically appropriate to, to what you've put together here. Now, uh, before we move on, let me ask you, The Reborn, can you uh, expound upon why it is The Reborn? There's always uh, such a, a tell in the games you've put together before in that uh, last part of the title. Yeah, I mean, I always uh, try to do that. It kind of has just become a brand name idea itself. But just something that people see a title with a colon in it, they kind of know it's got something to do with me. Yeah. But uh, it all began because I think it's a very simple way to explain a game and yet still have some of her unique word as well. Like when Vampire came out, I decided let's call it Vampire on the cover. I don't want to call it some The Long Night or, or you know, The Endless Night because then they don't really know what that is. You know, let's call it Vampire. And it's funny because a lot of the TV shows that are successful like Vampire Diaries do the same thing. They take the same idea. And so the Vampire of the Masquerade, I thought, really summed up the game very, very well. It's a game of vampires, but what's almost as important as the vampires is the fact that they are hiding among us. You know, there's a secret society. So second is the reborn. The idea of reborn, of course, is that, first of all, it's me coming back to something I love, vampires. You know? So it's, it's me being reborn. But it's also sort of the name they call themselves uh, – and in this world, you know, they, they, they consider themselves uh, succubi, but uh, they, they call themselves we are the reborn. Because when, you know, uh, when, when some another vampire turns into a vampire, they believe that you are reborn in that moment. So it's part of the setting as well. Well, you know, I think that, that really works well to sum it up very quickly, getting, getting people into that idea and sort of transferring that idea of, succubus which in themselves in the gaming industry are often thought of in a spiritual context as uh, devils or demons and the sort of spiritual malignant entity but in fact really mythologically speaking they are a middle eastern sort of vampire uh, so using that and recasting it a little bit while keeping true to the original idea you come at it from a slightly different slant which I always think ideas like that, sort of um, re-mythologizing or taking from the, the source material as opposed to the gaming canon of other games can really be provocative and is a great way to uh, to, design, to game design, to give you something interesting to work with. Yeah, and I'm not trying to take anything away from White Wolf or, uh, or Mind's Eye Theater. In fact, I want this to be a way to recruit new people into the whole live-action world. Uh, you know, I just I didn't have a license to <laughs> World of Darkness. I sold uh, White Wolf. So this is just sort of a, you know, a little mini uh, group, you know. Uh, I, I almost think of it as like a third group. You have the Camarilla, Sabat, and then you have the Reborn, <laughs> the Succubi, the Succubus. So, um, you know, but basically I, I think this game could be easily used by people who are playing Mind's Eye Theater. Uh, which is being relaunched. Uh, very exciting. Uh, and uh, I think that whole uh, live action world is going to be coming back to life in a big way. Well, Mark, I think you've just said something there that is a great selling point for anyone else there that is that big vampire fan. And we know we have such an enormous, I can tell you from, from my channel and some of the other channels here, that deal with, I guess, what you call now a retro world of darkness. There's an enormous following of people who still love and play those games. And when you you bring in you just basically you basically just said hey you could just slant this right in there and have another faction import it into your into your game there and use these these ideas as a, a launch pad for additional creativity a new window and vehicle into uh, rejuvenating a vampire the masquerade uh, game in a new slant so I think that's an absolutely wonderful uh, reason just by itself to buy the product outside of the fact you can do an entirely different style of game with it. So 
I think everyone out there, you need to think about that. And now, uh, moving on, Mark, I know there's another project that's, uh, I've heard the whispers on the wind, uh, <laughs> we have, we have uh, discussed, and I'd like just to give a teaser, just to give just a snippet to get the people uh, uh, tantalized by the idea of what is lurking around in that nugget of yours uh, that we're going to be seeing uh, soon enough. Well, um, I have a new modern horror game coming out, a role-playing game, which I think is going to be pretty fabulous. It's going to be a completely uh, new take on a very old idea uh, and a very popular idea um, and very much horror and very much you play the role. I, I can't go too much into it, but, but just like Vampire at its time was kind of shocking because you were the vampire, not hunting the vampire, you were playing the vampire. This is another case of a monster which no one has really thought of as you are this creature, and in this game you will be the creature. So, so and it's a, and because it's so new, it's uh, it's actually quite a brand new concept in how the society works, how they live, and uh, it's completely different from the world of darkness. It's much more science fiction, but uh, I think it's going to be, uh, I don't know, I'm super excited. It's uh, it's been a whole lot of fun to work on. Yeah, absolutely. And Mark, of course, shared some with me about what this is about, so I could tell you uh, without overstepping that you guys, when, when you see it, you're going to go, "Oh yeah, it makes complete sense. It flows. It's natural." But it, it's it's something that's come at from a normal direction, and then it's flipped. He's taken it and he's flipped around what what you would be expecting here in a way, but still presenting the, the other material as well. So I think it's going to really grab people. And I know those of you that love Vampire the Masquerade, and those of you that love the original World of Darkness, from what I've heard here, I, this sounds like it's going to be an absolute A-plus winner. And, of course, Mark Wynn, that's coming out. We'd love to have you back to talk more about that. I think it's going to be Absolutely. A, fantastic, a fantastic idea for what I've said. And I'm, I'm much looking forward to getting involved with that game myself. So... Uh, you know, thank you for, for sharing that. Now, let's start from the beginning. We've, we've gotten the very, uh, the very current and even the future of what you're doing, Mark. But let's rewind time and go all the way back to when you were just a little guy, Mark, and you started out in RPGs. Oh, what, what was your, your first experience in RPGs? How did you come into it? How are you... Um, brought into it at what age, and what was it that you first experienced? Um, wow, uh, yeah, I guess uh, my father was a Lutheran minister, and uh, every year they'd have an intern uh, come to town, uh, you know, a young pastor learning how to be a pastor. My father was always the mentor every year, and, uh, and this intern was uh, around, and um, Basically, he said to my dad and I after Sunday lunch, "I've ever heard of a game called Dungeons and Dragons," and and uh, I'd already been playing quite a bit of a choir and uh, and war games with my dad. I must have been like 14, 13. and he described it to me. And I'm like, "Oh yeah, I I I, do, I totally want to play that." You know, I just read The Hobbit, all that uh, Lord of the Rings, and so uh, we sat down and we did um, a dungeon. My dad was a dwarf cleric. I was uh, uh, an elven fighter, and uh, it was fantastic. I started showing up to this guy's apartment, <laughs> asking him questions, you know, how to build my character, da da da, da. And then he left, and, uh, and I had to find a new group. And so uh, fortunately, we geeks have radar, you know. And uh, I went to the neighboring town of the video arcade, and uh, found some geeks, joined a group. Uh, but then, of course, uh, the worst possible thing happened. I, I kept insisting on storytelling and uh, continuity and uh, having it all make sense. And uh, after a year and a half, they kicked me out of the group. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was kicked out of the group because uh, I, I want to go a little bit differently. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of us who enjoy the immersive style like we do, uh, I'm sure have had those problems before with not quite finding the, the right group of people uh, to get involved with. Yeah, and it's hard to live in the country. You know, I, I wasn't a city boy. I was a lived far out in the country in a little small town. It's, it's, it's tough. You know, but then I went to Australia and I became sort of the game master for a bunch of surfer dudes, and uh, and that's sort of where it sort of blew up. And then I went on to college, where I happened to meet Lisa Stevens, who owns Paizo Press and does uh, Pathfinder game. Uh, Jonathan Tweet, who redid uh, you know Dungeons and Dragons, the first big new edition of Dungeons and Dragons after Wizard of the Coast bought it. And uh, uh, John Nephew, who owns Atlas Games, and uh, they're in college. It's kind of a you know a who's who of gaming. We're all there together, and uh, um, and we basically all end up starting a bunch of different companies, including uh, you know among them was the Coast, White Wolf, Atlas. Yeah. You know, that's uh, that's just bizarre, really, and a lot of a lot of different. Eras of different uh, creative ventures I know have, have started like that, but having that sort of a, a roster sheet in one university at one time is uh, was just odd. It's very, very, very odd. So I mean, that's very cool to have had that, that sort of group to play off of. And I'm sure the exchanges and ideas were were very uh, interesting, very plentiful uh, in, in an idea like that. So uh, you've, you've jumped here. Let's let's talk about how you first. Uh, became a producer of RPGs. Now, if I'm if I'm correct, Ars Magica was the first game that you worked on. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, we did have a product called Whimsy Cards, mm -hmm. which were these little cards that you could play. Um, and the game master would give you one or two, and you could play them during the the game. You know, uh, and it was just a, a story interruption card. And it was kind of our first experiment, and kind of you know. How do you let players get involved in the story a little bit? And then we moved on to Ars Magica, which, uh, you know, was uh, very popular, critically speaking, <laughs> but uh, never quite had sales. Although now I believe it's in its fifth printing and it's uh, still in print. So uh, that's pretty good. There's lots of games that are not still in print. So so I'm quite proud of Ars Magica. It, it's not as... Um, it's showing its age a little bit, but I think it's still a, a pretty fantastic concept. Well, I remember when I first saw Art Magic many, many years ago, with the concept of the wizards, and I believe they were called the Grogs. Is that right? The yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the the other guys are playing the wizard itself. It it was a game that wasn't concerned with the power balance at all. It was the the role playing connection. Of course, the wizard is, has this power, but you know, how do we tell the story? How do we how do we move around there? And even in Ars Magica, you see such a, a different direction than a lot of other games were taking at the time. It was a, a game with a similarity to, say, uh, Dungeons and Dragons in a lot of ways, but with much more of a focus on creating the character you saw in your head, much more of a focus on being able to design a character with flaws and have a much stronger core of storytelling, of role-playing, and you can definitely see that comes through in Ars Magica, which I think in World of Darkness, that that idea really blossoms. I think that's you know we could really really see that that come to fruition. But uh, yeah, that's always been my my thing in role playing is that I love 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 not fiction. I love novels uh, and I love movies. Uh, I just love storytelling. I love it. Uh, and I've always been in love with the idea of the ancient storytellers. So sitting with a campfire. Weaving a tale, you know, and I love telling stories to my kids in, in the same way, just making up a story. But I also love that, you know, you can, you can in, involve people. And then it's not, you know, I, I'm not all about the whole idea of the game master is God and you're his little pawns and he's going to put you on this adventure through a dungeon. I like it to be troop style play more, uh, more of an interactive story. And so, you know, that's been my lifelong obsession is sort of immersing myself in the stories having a real character in a real world. And, and I think Ars Magica was just my first chance to be part of something where, where we could put that in, you know? Yeah, and I, I think definitely when you look back 
at Ars Magica and you compare it to the other items of the time, the game stands head and shoulders above in a way that I think I think in a lot of ways the, the closeness of proximity to a lot of other, the, there's so many fantasy style games at that point. I believe that, you know, Ars Magica seems like it got lost in the shuffle. I remember people would always mention it, but I think a lot of people, they didn't, their own mentality didn't break and get up to that level until until the World of Darkness stuff came out. I think it, it came at those same core ideas and principles in a way that seemed to make it more digestible to people when when they when they really got a hold of it. There was definitely... Yeah, a, I think I realized, you know, after, uh, you know, our sponsor came out and I was still eating ramen noodles and day-old donuts that I could buy for a half price, that, uh, that you know, the, the ideas of storytelling and such are solid, and doing innovative game is solid, but you've got to have a theme that just is going to grab people and make them s sit up. And, and it's got to be something new. And so we were thinking, oh, we'll do storytelling in a fantasy world. Everyone will flock to it because everyone loves fantasy. Well, no. I mean, the thing is that at the time, everyone had D&D, &D, and they still do. And they're happy with D&D. If you like fantasy, you play D&D, &D, right? Why would you play something else? So you, you, you kind of, I think uh, it's, it's very important for any, uh, anyone out there who uh, likes to design games. It's, it's, it's really important to try and do something new. If you do fantasy, then try to do it in a new way. You know, try to do it in a way that, that, that is new. And, or, or, or try to do something that, that may not be seen as fantasy, even though it may have a lot of fantasy themes. You know, but doing something new is very important. Absolutely, you definitely need a, a hook and a gimmick to to bring it in, and then I, you definitely found it with a vampire. I, I can remember. I believe Vampire came out in ninety one. Is that correct? Yep. Because uh, I, I remember when those books came out in the shelves, and people just went, and I could see that that creep into any other game people were playing, whether they were playing Star Wars or Rifts or D&D, that role-playing just started creeping up to a higher degree and a higher level. And then from opening the Vampire book at the first time, I went, whoa, this guy gets it. This guy uh, gets it in a way that I haven't seen anywhere else. And I, you know, just reading through book after book after book, picking up tidbits that were just scattered here and there to really form a foundation for role-playing. And for me, certainly of any game that I ever played, Vampire the Masquerade had the vastly the largest degree of influence on... Uh, learning tools for actually role playing, and uh, you know, and I've told you that before. I think Vampire the Masquerade to this day is still the best role playing game that's ever been made. And and uh, let's bring it in and talk about Vampire the Masquerade. We're other than having the gimmick to produce a storytelling element. What are the seeds that created Vampire the Masquerade? Why was it vampire? Right off the bat, why was it that instead of something else? What what brought all of that together? Vampires in the real world behind the hidden uh, idea of this masquerade and so forth. Let's talk about the genesis of this. Well, uh, when I was working on uh, Ars Magica uh, that summer in college, Jonathan Tweet uh, hung out at my house and uh, spent the summer at my house. So we could work on the game together, and we went to go see the movie Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, and after the movie, we're just so excited. We just had such a good time. You know, there's nothing like going to a movie in your early 20s. You haven't seen that many yet. <laughs> the, the new summer movie is still, like, the huge thing. It's just so great, and we're just so enthused. And I just remember Jonathan saying, man, I just love vampires. I wish you could do a game of vampires, but it will get so boring to always be hunting vampires. And I, and I said, you know what? There's got to be a way. There's a way to do it. There's a way to do it. And, uh, and when I say that, I get very stubborn, and I tend to think of the idea over and over and over again. So anyway, I was eating day-old donuts, uh, very, very poor, living, living incredibly cheap in this group house in Atlanta, Georgia. We had moved down there. Uh, Jonathan had left already, but I was with uh, um, Stuart Wick, and Lisa Stevens, and uh, just this big dump of a house. And on our way, and I just was like desperate to come up with a new idea for a game that would be popular. And uh, on the, I, mean, I just kept telling everyone, just you know, once I figure it out, I need, need you know, six months, six months. Just leave me alone. I'll write it. I'll do it. Uh, you know, but just, when I have the idea, I'm gonna have the idea. And on the way to Gen Con, which was in Milwaukee at the time, it just came to me. Boom. And uh, within, I'd say, 20 minutes, 
I had a pretty good idea what it was going to be about. You know, a mafia idea of vampires, a super society, with these different clans all fighting for control of the world from the shadows. Uh, and then at Gen Con that year, I didn't have a whole lot of fun. I just mainly worked on the game. You know, day in, day out. And then I went back to Atlanta, and the next nine months was basically me locked in a room. It was intense. <laughs> but, you know, it's like there's moments like that you kind of realize, you know, unconsciously I've been preparing for this day, you know. And, and the good thing is I didn't really know a lot about vampires. I'd read Anne Rice uh, after I came with the idea, of course. Uh, and so I read her, and I started watching vampire movies. But honestly, I hadn't, I didn't know a lot about vampires. I, I didn't. But, but over that nine months, I, I fell in love with vampires. That's for sure. Well, it's very interesting to hear that the, uh, I guess maybe the original genesis of the idea comes from Lost Boys. Uh, certainly, really a movie that everyone out there, I know some younger people that may actually have never seen that movie or watch, you definitely want to check that one out. A really just a very, very, very interesting movie and uh, in terms of the vampire. The funny thing is, is on the way to L.A. to my first meeting with uh, Spelling to do the TV show. Oh, yeah, this, my, about that. this is my first meeting to do the TV show. And so my girlfriend and I are driving down Highway 1 to go to L.A. because we've just already been to San Francisco to see some friends at, uh, at Chaosium. So... Um, we're in Santa Cruz, and I'm out at the boardwalk, uh, and I'm looking down this uh, bridge, and I'm looking at the boardwalk, I'm looking at the roller coaster, looking at the bridge, and I realize the bridge in Lost Boys, where they hang off of it and then drop down into the mist, and the bridge is actually only like 20 feet off the ground, <laughs> but I was just like amazed. I was like walking around with it going, yeah, they filmed Lost Boys here. My girlfriend hadn't seen it. She had no idea what I was talking about. But I'm like, they filmed Lost Boys here. It's a sign. It's a sign. We're doing a TV show. I'm telling you, it's a sign. I was very excited. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, that, that that definitely all kind of plays back and together. Well, since you brought it up, I have a bunch of questions I was going to bring up later about that, but let's go into it right now. Why not? How was, What was it like to work with Aaron Spelling? I guess that's really the beginning question for... I mean, he, he had a big house, um, and... Uh, yeah, here's the thing, advice I always give people is in Hollywood, they don't need contracts. If they're bigger, than, we never signed a contract until after the show was in production. And I was actually banned from the set for a while, off and on, not just once, a couple different times, because I wouldn't sign the contract, because I said, you, you're, I'm not going to sign it. And they're like, okay, you're banned. I'm like, you cannot do this. You cannot go ahead and do this without a, without a contract. This is illegal. And they're like, sue us. So it was, it, was a, it was actually really a horrifying thing, you know, uh, and uh, Aaron Spelling was nice, but Duke, his business partner, the, you know, the, the guy you don't want to mess with, basically, uh, he was a nightmare. And, uh, you know, and, and Hollywood's very, uh, I mean, I had a lot of fun in Hollywood, you know, I did a lot of writing after the, after the show, I, I kept... I stayed in Hollywood and wrote a lot of scripts, and you know, and part of me wish I stayed here, but I just met too many script writers who are living a fantastic life in big house, and every time I'd ask them, well, how many of your movies have been made, and what what are you doing? Uh, oh no, none of my movies have been made. I just I just write scripts or do rewrites, but uh, you know, I met so many guys who haven't had anything made ever, and I was like, I can't live like that. I, I can't, I can't live like that. So I gave that up. But I made a fair bit of money uh, in a couple of years, you know. It was fun. Now, it's great. give us some of your impressions about Kindred, the embrace. It was very controversial in the, for those that I knew in the vampire uh, playing community at the time. It presented a very uh, uh, limited sort of dumbed-down version of what, what you'd envisioned. You had only five clans, and, of course, later the Asimites. Uh, came in. You were you were no Malkavians or Tremere within within the city. The uh, they had what I think a ten year old character that was trying to a ten year a vampire that had been around for about ten years was attempted to be part of uh, like uh, the Primogen. And there were a lot of ideas that didn't 
that didn't fit with that in, in terms of disciplines and so forth. Yeah, they, they hired a guy who, you know, in classic Hollywood fashion, you know, you want, everyone wants to put their own stamp on something so they can claim credit if it succeeds, but keep enough of the old so that if it fails, they can blame that. And so, you know, this guy who was famous for writing the blue and the gray, um, you know, kind of took me in his house. I pretty much lived with him for several months as we worked on this project. And then, you know, and then basically he just, I thought he had an idea, but it was all a politics. It was all, it was all a game, you know, and I was just a young, <laughs> I was a very young, nice guy at the time. Uh, and I didn't realize quite how bad people could get, you know, and, and how they could sort of, you know, I didn't quite catch on just how bad it was. So, um, yeah, the TV show was just very difficult. For me, very depressing because I knew what it almost was. I, I knew what we had talked about and what was going on. And then he disappeared for a month to write the first episode. And when I got it in my hands, I was just—it was just appalling. Uh, and I got—I got to do some changes to it and fix it a little bit. But, but basically, the deed was done. It was bad. But uh, that's not to say I didn't like uh, Mark. Mark was awesome. Mark was, uh, you know, just a, a real good friend and just what a, a truly awesome guy. So sad, for, you know, when he died, I just, I just, really depressing. He's sure. just one of those good-looking guys who's like, you know, there's some, some people who are just so incredibly good-looking that even if you're not drawn to good-looking people and maybe even... I'm kind of, you know, drunk pushed away a little bit sometimes. It's, it's too much. He was so good looking, but so freaking nice and charming and cool. I mean, he had his demons, but, but uh, he was just a freaking awesome guy, an incredible actor. Given the right script with the right, you know, stuff, that show could have been legendary. I, I know it. For those of you that aren't, that familiar with the show, Mark's talking about the uh, star of the show who died in a motorcycle accident. He was uh, the yeah. prince of the city, and that, that was essentially the end of the show there. Um, the, the show itself, one of the elements I think that they hit best on the head uh, was Clan Nosferatu, with the uh, Nosferatu primage and unwillingness to bestow the, 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 the blood on the people. The, the fact that no... I, I am cursed. I, this is a horrid thing. So having that, that sort of sadness. I think of all the clans, uh, that one was really hit well. The, the scene where all the, all the Nosferatu descend and just start tearing that guy apart uh, from the shadows, that really came off well. I've seen each of the episodes maybe four or five times. Um, it was a short run show, and it certainly had its problems, as we discussed here. But there were uh, some very strong points to it as well. There were some things that came true to what your vision was, I think. And honestly, I think that's where it succeeded in every in every level where it succeeded. Uh, and I would love to have seen it if it hadn't been dumbed down. Uh, what would you would you, you think, uh, I guess we could go into this and come back to the vampire a little bit because we're already on to the uh, production side of things, television and movies. What do you think about the huge spawn of ideas? If I pick up and I watch Underworld or, or True Blood particularly, True Blood looks like they just picked this book up with a thesaurus and made their made their show. It was just this plus a thesaurus, and that's that's True Blood. I mean, it it's Vampire the Masquerade with yeah. you know, other World of Darkness bits in. I mean, I mean, I think it's incredibly flattering. I, I wish my show had worked <laughs> enough so that, but you know, I, obviously they saw what a mess and a hack that spelling did uh, yeah. of it, and they came along and went, yeah, we can take this. And, and, and also, they have every right to. I mean, ideas are not, you can't patent an idea. And thank goodness for that. Uh, you know, we need a creative commons of humanity. That is, you know, things, copyrights need to last, lapse. And, uh, uh, and, and I think ideas cannot be copyrighted, just, you know, uh, precise characters can be and, and, and such. Uh, and they should lapse, uh, and I and so I, I'm I'm flattered. I'm not annoyed. I'm flattered. Uh, it'd be nice to get a little more credit, but I, I think you know, for obvious reasons, creators want to hide their sources. 
and I've gotten a lot of trouble over the years. I've been made fun of constantly for my famous quote, creativity is hiding your sources. Yeah. But I really believe in that. I think that we all stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, we all have taken our ideas from someone else. You know, my ideas were partially borrowed from the Godfather, partially from Anne Rice, uh, partially from, you know, uh, uh, Bram Stoker and uh, Mary Shelley. Uh, you know, all, all these people I stole from, and I tried to hide it. <laughs> because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to hide it so it feels like something brand new, and, and people have that moment of, oh, what, what, what is this? And, and that's an amazing moment, isn't it? When you open up some comic book or some role-playing game or you start a movie and you just realize that this is not some another dumb movie or some another dumb rip-off comic superhero book, but it's actually something new, you know? And that's awesome, but we've got to realize in that moment of it feeling new that still, you know, we borrow everything from somewhere. Sure. Like, like they say, in terms of ideas, there's nothing new under the sun. It's just always repackaged and, and shined up a little bit. How have any of these groups ever reached out to you, the, uh, this, the script writers for uh, True Blood or the, the writers for... Oh, no, 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 no. No? No. It would, uh, it, would, it would seem almost like a natural fit to try to bring you into a job as an uh, executive producer or even a writer on a show like that. Well, you got to understand that Hollywood is all about power. So you have to have a very, very confident showrunner who would bring in someone like me because then I, I could usurp their authority in, in a way. That's why they almost always hire 20-somethings, you know? If, if, you, if you can't make it in Hollywood in your 20s, then you're going to have a hard time later on because no one wants to hire someone older and smarter and wiser because then they can steal your job from you. And Hollywood's a very, very much a dog-eat-dog -dog world where your best friend will <laughs> fuck your wife and uh, get, get you to lose your job all in the same day. You know? Yeah. This is, this is Hollywood. This is how it works. This is not some funny made-up thing. This is, a, this is in many ways a very, very tough, hard world. And, uh, and, and there's some very wonderful pockets of great awesome people, mostly in comedy, by the way, but, but, but a large part of the rest of Hollywood is just, it's mean, it's vicious, it's, it's, it's bad. It's hard, you know? Yeah, well, I, I think overall that from looking at, from the A to the Z now, the whole vampire revolution that's gone on since uh, maybe the late 90s, where things have really took off from vampire, from the Vampire the Masquerade platform, and to seeing the the tendrils like an old Elder Sombra snaking into so many different creative projects, it's very interesting. And I've had even uh, uh, like a niece who's like fourteen say, "Oh yeah, this and that." I'm like, "Yeah, a uh, guy named Mark Reinhagen created that in this book over here. Let, let, let me let me show you where where those ideas come from in in uh, the canon of of this huge vampire mythology." Uh, so, Ab, it is very, very interesting that you've had such a uh, incredible influence there. I mean, really, uh, Vampire the Masquerade is like a seminal work on the uh, sort of the encyclopedia uh, for for vampires uh, in, in a lot of ways. Of course, you know, you'll see bits in this movie or that movie that has more of an original idea. But I mean, particularly like if you look at True Blood, which is or Underworld, you know, both extremely clearly influenced. It's uh, yeah, I, it is amazing to me, like to just sort of see, oh, they got clans, you know, oh, they've got you know these uh, this this war going on. Okay, oh, okay, they hate werewolves. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's okay. So far, uh, I think I'm pretty sure I made up all these. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. the authority is the best one, and uh, the true body. Something called the authority, which is very clearly the Camarilla, just down to a T. Yeah. Uh, I thought I went, whoa, okay. Uh, I see where all that comes from. But let's let's uh, rewind now a little bit. We've kind of jumped ahead oh, where I was going to go with speaking about – oh, well, we're, we're already there. i, I got to bring this one up, and, of course, you all know why. A certain other group came to you and licensed from White Wolf a particular uh, clan for – 
uh, a certain individual named David Heath, and David Heath took on the role not as the vampire warrior, but as Gangrel, <laughs> they pronounced it as, for the WWF at the time. That was so yeah. freaking awesome. Yeah, T tell me about how all that went apart. Who, who contacted you or, or who had contacted someone in your company? How did that whole thing come about? Because you know we're going to talk about wrestling here, baby. If you have a fire, <laughs> you know, fire. Oh, you know, I was actually pretty busy with the Hollywood stuff at the yeah. time. So I didn't have a lot to directly do with this, but I think this was uh, uh, Mike Tinney was pretty big on this thing and uh, Chris McDonough. And it was just like a, one of these incredible opportunities. And, uh, I mean, oh, my God, I, I I screamed myself silly the first time I saw him, <laughs> which is so great. Uh, you know, uh, and I just sort of wish it could have gone further, but, but it's just, you know, one of those really fun things that happened, you know? How, how great is that? It's absolutely amazing. I remember seeing that, of course, as a wrestling fan and someone that very well knew Vampire the Masquerade. And I knew the wrestler David Heath before that with the Vampire Warrior gimmick, the Lestat gimmick he did, and then coming out with the with the with the frilly uh, 19th century shirt on with the chalice of blood, with the glasses, the blonde hair, rising from the stage with that incredibly uh, sort of gothic-y metal-like music he had, with the throbbing heartbeat pace. And it was Gangrel. I, I, that completely, you know, was a was a shock to me. Obviously, I was uh, fully involved with, with that character that storyline yeah. right from the you know. Um, but no, who, I, I say I'm not completely sure about this, and I'm really pretty sure that he actually they didn't realize that Gangrel was belonged to us, and he used the name oh. uh, on the stage, and then of course we caught them going, "Hey, we own that name." But we want you to keep using it because we think it's awesome. We're big fans. We'll give you a really good deal, yada, yada, yada. But, of course, you know, as soon as they realized they didn't own the name, then they were less interested in, in working with it. So I can remember even seeing that back in a video game, like in the, in the titles, copyright White Wolf, Gangrel, right there in, in, the, in the titles with, with all the other stuff. And you don't really... I mean, that's really a rarity to see something like that. It's wrestling does not, WWE does not like to uh, push forward things that they don't own. Oh, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's just one of those uh, weird things, you know. He's pretty popular for a while, but it was pretty cool to watch wrestling and have him announce Gangrel, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> I made that up. I yeah. made up that word. And it's on national TV. I made up that word. It was yeah. like a character coming to life. You know, it's like really cool. There's, yeah. you know, all these people chanting his name. And I was like watching going, fuck. I, I remember being in a bar once in L.A. and it was on. And I was like, I, I made that name. I said the bar. Drinks for everyone, if you believe me. And like it's L.A. So I'm like, no, we don't believe you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that really, I couldn't even imagine how, how cool that would be to see your, I mean, it's one thing to, to, to see someone role play something you've made and that's such a huge rush. But then to literally see it, in the real life, in the real world, as a real person out there, uh, that's that's just absolutely amazing to, to yeah. see the influence. Um, now, I don't know if – I'm not sure exactly how the name came to be on him. I know he, uh, David Heath, has actually said – well, he actually feels he is a uh, – if, if he was a vampire, he would be a member of Clan Brujah and uh, not, not Gang Girl. So that, that was uh, you know, just something I've heard him say before in an interview. Now – Going back, because we've, we've talked about the, all the media and so forth, and I know most people, I know most of you out there in YouTube land want to hear about this. This <laughs> vampire masquerade, the red rose, the green text, the the elegance and the simplicity even there, you can see from all its iterations, it pretty much always looked the same. Let's talk about it at the beginning of Vampire the Masquerade. There's certain aspects that have almost uh, a numerology quality to them. Was the number 13 intended in that significance? Because we see that occur so often uh, throughout the entire World of Darkness line. 13 appears over and over and over again. Is that intentional? Uh, is absolutely. 7 and 13, uh, these are very intentional numbers. I'm not a numerologist. I'm not um, really very spiritual. Uh, you know, I'm not a spiritualist or, you know, um, but uh, I do think that human psychology, that numbers are very, very important. 
and, and, and you know, uh, in Chinese culture, the number four has a very profound, you know, significance. Uh, and, uh, but in Western culture, you know, what are our important words? Three, seven, nine, and 13. Those are our big numbers. So I use them over and over again. You'll see the number three over and over again in the world of darkness. And, and that kind of, uh, uh, I'm not sure if that ever has been revealed, but the, the sort of the mythic structure of the world of darkness is all based on this, this trinity idea of, of what's the base of it. And of course, the world of darkness is all based on the idea that uh, that what you believe in is the truth. And so, if you have a strong enough willpower, or enough people to agree with you to believe in something, that will change the fabric of reality itself. Which is, of course, the whole idea behind wraith is that you know. You have these. If you if you break away, enough people who agree with you, you can break away and form a nice little realm we can live in. You know, your own little paradise. But 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 really, for the main reality as well, this is true. This is this is what you know the mages do. Is they sort of are able to have a strong enough will, they can sort of break this consensus and do what they want. And so uh, you know, the numbers are very sort of important in that because well, people believe in numbers. Then numbers are important. And. Uh, and I just see people react to numbers so profoundly. I mean, I mean, there's still buildings that don't have a, a 13th floor, you know? Yeah. That's, that's crazy. I mean, that's crazy. But there are many buildings don't have a 13th floor. It's, you know, so, so that's why I worked it in, is, is that I, you know, you, as, a, as a writer, as, an, as a designer, you give me any tool to affect people's emotions, and I will use it to bash them over the head. You know, and, and role-playing games, unlike board games or computer games, you know, you can really, you have so many things you can throw at them. You know, the art, the words, a little twist of how this rule works, and, and, and so I think you really, you know, the whole idea in role-playing game is to sort of really immerse the players in the world and give them a lot to think about or because we're gamers, a lot to argue about. <laughs> yes, yeah, I have uh, the countless World of Darkness arguments I've heard, but the fact that you have a, a, a smoothness and a less reliance on system as opposed to role playing, I think uh, can even even that kind of help help minimize that that sort of uh, horror. There, it's it's a game that's uh, a bit more difficult to to rules law you're in, and for that, I think it. It doesn't attract a certain type of player that is at home or in a different type of game that, quite honestly, I think works for you and that is an advantage. Now, you, you brought up really quickly uh, sort of a segment into Wraith the Oblivion into Mage of the Ascension. Now, you talked about the idea of what I think is dictatoriality, and we definitely see that in those games and a little bit in Werewolf, but we don't really see that in Vampire. And Vampire from all the other World of Darkness games, stands out starkly different. There is, particularly in the early incarnations, a very heavy Judeo-Christian, either as God, there is right, there is uh, this aspect of Cain, and this dissension, that it has a higher um, uh, mythology, a history that's so deep, uh, deeply entrenched and so evocative, uh, going back, you know, biblically, and uh, bringing in some other mythologies and so forth, that it, uh, to me it it really, it, it seems the least like the other World of Darkness games, really, overall. It has, uh, and there's a lot of reasons that we could go into that, but it has a very special, distinctive flair to it in the fact that vampires, overall, really aren't tuned in to what's happening. You know, they're, they're I mean, your mages are way up here. They know what's going on, but your vampires... Are, are disconnected from that, and that in itself makes them so much more human, so much more part of uh, the, that first sort of layer of the world of darkness, which I think makes them easier for people to understand and relate to. Yeah, I mean, if I had to really do it all over again, I would not make them so overwhelmingly powerful, but, you know, our market research showed that that's what people wanted to do. They wanted to be their wizards, to be reality vendors, but I, I, I think, you know, and of course... The one problem with role-playing game series is that you always have the equivalent of what is called mission creep in the Pentagon. That is, you know, the deeper you get in your mission, the more broad your mission becomes. Well, in gaming, what happens is that as you go along, players want more and more powers. Yeah. And then the game company gives it to them. 
and then it just sort of spirals out of control and becomes not human anymore. It becomes it becomes so removed from a, a, a nor regular player's experience and so difficult to run for a storyteller that it's kind of ruined. And, and and even worse, and what's by far worse about this mission creeping in gaming is that later gamers coming along and are like, oh my god, this is so complicated. I don't understand it. I don't want to be part of this. Whereas if it was just still the original book and that's it, then they'd be much more likely to get involved. Which is why with a game I'm coming out with this summer, it's going to be very, very clear that all you need is two things. You know, these cards and this book and you're done. You know? Just make it simple. Keep it really simple. Uh, I love that. But uh, at the same time, I mean, Mage is a... Uh, you know, people love mage because they can, you know, they can argue about the nature of reality. And, you know, it's a, it's a game by philosophers for philosophy students, you know. And I think a lot of gamers have a little bit of a philosopher in them, you know, um, arguing um, about the nature of reality. Yeah, I'm definitely a, a very big fan of Mage. I played in a Mage game that lasted for about seven years with the same character. Uh, and I just logged a tremendous amount of hours. The longest I've ever played any game was Mage the Ascension. Uh, wow, seven years. I think my channel here has more videos on Mage the Ascension than any other channel on YouTube. Uh, and I continuously get to get loads of questions about Mage the Ascension. And, and certainly, uh, it was just an absolutely fascinating game. But... Dealing with Vampire, you originally introduced seven clans. Now, even back then, you, you kind of allude to other things. Were, what, what, was it kind of a, a wrestling around in your head with which seven to put in? I think, I'm guessing you had at least some good concepts of some of the other, which became the 13 clans. I would, I'm guessing that some of those could have been interjected into 13 in your ideas, or can, can you kind of walk through how those the, that that particular seven evolved, and if any of those other seven that that or any of the other uh, six, I mean, could have been been slot? Was it like uh... yeah? Other people who were involved in the company were really pushing me because I had post-it notes all over my wall. If you came into my office back when, which is and by the way, back then my office is also my bedroom. So it gives you some idea of how hard I was working. But my wall was completely covered in paper. And I would categorize groupings, you know, arrogant. And I'd move it from next to uh, elite, and I'd move it over to outcast. You know, or I'd just sort of rearrange the, the groupings of adjectives and play with it. Um, but it fairly quickly, within like two months, you know, and I knew the clans were the core of the game. Sure. I mean, it was very, very obvious that, and, and I was very proud of the idea that I had that uh, these clans were political. They were, weren't just a character class. Um, they were political. And in fact, they're, they're much more political than our prior character class. Character class-wise, all they do is give you discipline. You know, they don't do very much. I mean, that's, that's the great, you know, switch of fate of the original book is that, is that they're not that key to creating a character. It's not like a... It's not like you're a fighter or a cleric in Dungeons and & Dragons and this is your entire path of your life. You know, it's just a discipline. But yet, it's central to the game. It's central. Uh, you know, these clans are everything. So creating them was very, very important. Everyone's trying to convince me to do 13 or... And they're like, more is better, Mark. More is better. And I was like, no. We have, pl we have years. And everyone thought I was insane, of course, because I would talk about this game will be around for decades. We have decades to work on this stuff. Don't worry about it. And they're like, no, put it all in. I'm like, no, seven is perfect. Seven is it, we want small numbers, small numbers. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. And, uh, of course, I won. But, uh, you know, some people have their egos bruised. You mentioned the clan discipline, you said just that, but it, it's one other thing too, and that's the weakness. And that weakness, to me, it tells even more. It's yes, it's, yes. It's a great thing because you don't have that when you're playing a, a, a cleric or a rogue or a fighter. You don't have a weakness, and that yeah. that that is su such a problem. Vampires themselves have so many weaknesses already, and that's what makes them human: the stake through the heart, the sunlight, and then you add another onto onto their name of Malkavian or Bruja or something, and that. I, I think more than anything else, mechanically, it's the weakness the clan has that even if it's only subliminal, 
kind of gets people so invested in. Yeah, a lot of people don't role play, but but it, but you know, a lot of this stuff is in there for the role players. Uh, if, if my my idea was, you know, give enough dice for people to shake who love dice, but let role players ignore the dice. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, give weaknesses and all that stuff in there, so it's even though people who don't play it, it's still like a thing they can allude to, even if they don't play out. But you know, I mean, how many times have you seen people play Mockabians who aren't actually insane at all? You know, they're basically just someone acting insane, but they never do anything that actually hurts themselves. It's it's kind of common, you know. Yeah. Um, but but uh, but I think I think role players love playing the weaknesses. That's you know, there's some people who love playing Mockabians to the detriment of their character. You know, that's the joy of it. it it's the joy of it for me. And I, I'm just so proud that that you know there are so many people who are who really are role playing. You know, that's great. I think, in all honesty, that particularly of your first seven clans, or maybe just overall to the the whole thirteen, and it's hard to say because I, I I tell you I have I have a lot of favorites and they do change, but I think Malkavians and I've said it before. I think are they're just the way they come across. They're so finely crafted. I think they come across really. Uh, the best of all the clans. They're, they're... Yeah, I used to work in a mental hospital, so uh, I, I know a lot about it. I worked in a mental hospital from age 16 all the way through college. Uh, Lion Rapid, my first company, was financed completely through working at nights at a mental hospital. And, uh, you know, uh, I was the expert because I was a wrestler. I was the expert putting people in basket holds. So sometimes they'd call me in, and I would have someone in a basket hold yeah. all night long holding them in a basket hold. <laughs> and that was my job, you know, talking people off the ledge, basically. So I think Malkavians definitely gained some verisimilitude just to the fact that I, I understand crazy pretty damn well. You know, I, 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 I know literally... Um, Hundreds of people who have mental health issues, and I, I think the Malkavians really because you you have crazy uh, across the board. We have Marauders, we have Silver Fangs, but the Malkavians to me are they just come across perfectly. They they're definitively better than either of those, and they're they're able to you're able to get so much use out of it, whether, you know, they go up or they go down. Uh, and I, I, of course, personally really, really enjoy them. Uh, I, you know, I think you did an excellent job there. Let me ask you a little bit about the Gangrel, not the wrestler Gangrel, but the Gangrel clan. Initially, there was a big tie in with the, the Gangrel and the Gypsies and the Gangrel and the Werewolves. Of course, we saw the Gangrel Gypsy thing sort of evolve into the Ravenos, and it becomes much more minimized in later editions and incarnations of Gangrel. And then the, the Werewolf thing, Initially, it's sort of presented in a way almost like they're kind of okay, and then that that grows into a huge chasm. There, can you kind of talk about how that evolves and kind of what your original ideas were uh, with with those uh, particular? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing about when you're designing, uh, you know, and it was pretty audacious, I think, to come up with, you know, vampire. Then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do a game a year for the next five years, and here's the five games. It's gonna be a whole universe. I mean, it's a pretty Cool idea, but audacious in the sense of it's really, really hard to pull off. I mean, that's a huge thing to pull off. So obviously, when I'm writing Vampire, I'm spending all my time thinking about vampires. How much did I even conceive of Werewolf at all after, you know, while I was working on Vampire? Very little. I kind of knew there were going to be nature lovers, obviously, live in the country, vampires in the city. That they hate vampires. Okay, that's cool. That works perfectly. Um, they're working against everything that the vampires stand for. But I didn't have anything else done on werewolves. I didn't know anything. I didn't even invented guru yet. I, I the words. I, it was just werewolf and some very basic ideas. So what happens is that as the world evolves, you add on these new ideas, and then you have to change things to make it fit. Slightly, you know, and so, uh, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would think I would make Gangrel and the Guru, uh, I would keep them linked together, but have it sort of, you know, fraught with difficulties, you know, uh, um, 
uh, you know, sort of, sort of, uh, you know, the guru are kind of the emissaries, uh, and, and they're sort of the only vampires allowed in the country. Um, but even they are not loved. But you know, hey, uh, I, you know, it, it works out the way it works out. You know, uh, in the end, you know, many, many, many people worked on the world of darkness, and I did micromanage. You know, I had a Bible, and I would refer to the Bible. And I would let the Bible be broken sometimes because they had really good ideas or or it's just not, you know, I, I, I could, you know, I could lose a really good writer if I told him no, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, so, so early on I kept very, very tight control. Like, no, it's got to be like this. But then once my vision is published, then my tendency is to, to let it go and let it sort of be what it is, you know. I've already put my mark on it. Uh, no pun intended, and uh, uh, you know, sort of letting it go. Let's move on to something else, you know. Well, and I think you kind of covered a question I had later. The the theme and the tone of the game, and the, the game is so tone and theme are so important to the game, both in the meta plot sense and in the overall teaching people about those aspects, which so often were just not mentioned in role playing games. Uh, and I can certainly say to anyone out there, when you think of those ideas, you will produce a much better game at your table. But you, you see from that original incarnation, and I've, I've owned every single incarnation of, uh, of the vampire books, except for, except for V20, because I just haven't gotten around to that one yet. But I've, I've bought every single of the, the core incarnations and read them all, and they change a lot. We could definitely see that it has a vision, and quite honestly... Uh, there's a lot of good things that happen as the game goes along. There's a lot of great ideas and things that come in, but the theme and the, the purity, it definitely doesn't, it doesn't have that same feel of excitement. It has uh, a, different, a different feel later on, a more sterile feel, and in some ways that certainly there's a load of great ideas that came with it, but if you pick up that original vampire book, and I tell people this, you, don't, you, could, you can run for the rest of your life just off, not even this one, the old paperback uh, with you know that 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 particular version of the vampire book it had a different feel to it than the later versions do and, and definitely i mean you kind of answer the whole question there they broke the bible they changed things it, you didn't have the same tight range you brought things in you accommodated you were flexible and uh you know yeah. and that has ups and downs to it it has ups and downs you know uh, i mean white wolf grew so quickly we went from living on day old donuts and ramen noodles to you know we had 50, 60, 100 employees. Uh, you know, it became corporate. And uh, corporations like what? They like things to come out on time. So it used to be, I would go, it's not done. I don't care. And then it, eventually, that's why I was sort of kicked out of my own company. And so I was like, I don't care. It's not done. You, you can't come with a new game. And so they kind of said, screw you. We're going to do our own game. And it was horrible, <laughs> you know? I was, I was doing this whole exile science fiction game, and I was like, it's just not done. It's not good enough. It's, it's better to wait. And, and they basically sort of put me out to pasture. And, uh, you know, that's sort of uh, it's just one of those things that happens to corporations, you know. Since you bring that up, I know you sold your portion of the company. So that's basically, was that basically the reason there were just too many internal problems? Well, that's when the sort of the, the the chasm happened. That's when I was like, okay, I got to do my own company again because they're they're just not going to let me have any say anymore uh, in how things go, and and so they're going to sort of uh, you know not do things the way I want to do it, which is I want it to be you know very much about the the storytelling and uh, the myth. You know, I'm very big into Joseph Campbell and yeah. Garcia Eliada, this whole you know the power of myth. And uh, and they were just in the mode of let's make some money, and I think the developers were still able to put a lot of art in there and a lot of really beautiful, amazing stuff. But of course, the trains had to run on time, and that was the paramount objective: is you have, you know, ten books to put out every year; they must come out in the day that you say they'll come out. Well, you know, that doesn't work for art very well, does it? Yeah, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. You know, oh. Hollywood doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, uh, most computer games don't work that way. 
the ones that do come out on time are generally the ones that tank. But, you know, it's, it was hard to explain that. Well, sure, I remember seeing the old adverts in the back, Meiji Ascension coming, and everyone's was like, oh, what's Meiji Ascension going to be? And, you know, then it would always, everything would always kind of get pushed back. But, I mean, to me, that doesn't really hurt you because if I want to buy Meiji Ascension, I'm not like, oh, screw it, I'm not buying it now. I'm like, oh, I have to have it. So the second it comes out, I'm pulling it off the shelves and buying it and reading it. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't really see that as a negative. And I certainly, when I'm reading it, I'm already reading it, I want to read the best that you have. I don't want to read the rushed ideas and, and the compromises, you know, yeah. so that's what really excites me, Mark, about this new game, this project that you alluded to and hinted at here, uh, the fact that it's not going to be, I'll be quite honest, and I love this this version of the game, but it is watered down uh, to a degree, as we've talked about here, to see the, the pure, undistilled version of horror, of science fiction, and of role-playing brought, brought in a new idea that, that, that takes ideas and flips them in a way. I, I really... I think that yeah. that's going to have a great tone. It's and, I have, and I have 20 years of experience now. In a way, it's 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 interesting. I feel like I'm just as uh, you know uh, tune in to pop culture. I I think that's sort of one of my gifts is that you know uh, I really really love pop culture and I'm really aware of it. And I think I'm still very contemporary in the gaming thing. But I mean, there really is a deal that I didn't realize this when I was. 20 years ago, but age does give you a wisdom, you know? You just yep. know so much more. It's, just, it's ridiculous how much more you know. And I think I'm bringing that to that new game as well. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure if the role-playing people are there as much as they might have been before, but I'm pretty sure the ones who are still there, they're going to be, uh, it's going to be something new. It's going to be something brand new. And, uh, and pretty much, hopefully, that exciting moment, like the first time you opened Vampire. So for the, 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 the clans here, let me put you on the spot and say, which, which clan and which discipline did you think turned out? <laughs> you like I, I, I always tell people that uh, I love all my children, and I cannot choose among them. You, know, you can't choose among them? No, no. Let's say, okay, Mark, you can't choose among your children, but which child brings home the highest report card grades? <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, the Malkavians always bring a smile to my face, but uh, uh, Tremere obviously get the best report cards, and, uh, and uh, the Ventru are just always elected class president. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the... The Bruges are always being sent home from school for violating this rule or that rule, but I always, you know, uh, I always, you know, let them go because they're just so darn cute. <laughs> well, the Bruges, they really had a lot of, particularly in the earlier incarnations, they are not, they have a, a strikingly non-political correctness to them. You see neo-Nazis mentioned, uh, particularly earlier on for them. You see, uh, you know, they're basically a lot of different uh, ethnic gang types, a uh, hard edge, gritty type of vampire. And then when you bring the Dark Ages out, you sort of flip it to give a juxtapose of these philosopher kings with this sort of uh, street rabble. And I thought that, that that really locked. And something I always tell people when they think of Ventru or think of Bourgeois, that, you know, it, it's two sides of a coin and they're very, very different faces. It just... A lot of a lot of depth that you can bring out with with that particular clan. Yeah, a lot more. Yeah. Once you get in the history of things, I think that's when you can bring out all that beautiful, lush poetry. But I, I like hardcore vampire stuff. You know, I think like the for me the Twilight sparkly vampire thing is is, is appalling. And 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 for me, I, I really just love. Uh, I think vampires need to be hardcore. I mean, come on, they're drinking people's blood. They're killing people. They're murderers. They're sociopaths and psychopaths. They're they're lit they are literally uh, serial killers. You know, I mean, this is what they're a special department of the mafia of the, I mean of the FBI is set up to track down the most horrifying people, and yet somehow they're making vampires into this sort of romantic, beautiful thing. When I think they are, but I think in so doing, you can't lose the sight lose sight of the fact that they are... Uh, They've forgotten what's behind the glove. The beauty is... Yeah, they're, they're bad. You know, they're, they're bad. 
And they're really bad, not like bad in like a handsome, cool guy way, you know, like the bad boy. I mean, they're evil. Well, and I think, I, think, and I, I, think that's, I think that's really interesting in a way. I, I think that's sort of, you know, that was the whole point of the humanity yeah. trait. Is that, is that, you know, uh, I know eventually you run out of humanity. I know almost no one plays it that way. Uh, it's not like, you know, most gamers, uh, game storytellers or game masters in Call of Cthulhu, I mean, they do enforce the sanity rules. And I realize that in World of Darkness, most storytellers don't enforce the humanity rules. But that was meant to sort of capture that. You know, a beast I am, less a beast I become. That, that was sort of the, the core principle of the game. And you're talking about beasts, and there's one beast that anyone that watches my channel know that we're going to be talking about here. A beast that is more of a beast than any other inside of Vampire the Masquerade, and they are the Bali. Can you kind of give me an idea of what your original thoughts were the Bali? And then I'm going to ask you a question about them. Oh, really? Love the Bali. Uh, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, I, it's been so long, I can't remember, remember what I was thinking when I thought of that. Um... I mean, the, the beast originally was was meant to be, uh, um, it was meant to be a metaphor, originally, you know, and for most of the time, it was strictly a metaphor. It was only a metaphor. And I believe in the original uh, World of Darkness book, there's no Bali even mentioned there. No. Or is it? I can't remember. No, they're not. They're not. Ever, they come along later. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's just one of those things that evolved out. Uh, you know, the, the the beast originally was was basically you know the frenzy. Uh, when you want a frenzy and you you're you're losing it, that is the beast coming out. And I had all this stuff about how you look in the mirror and you know I was thinking I was always uh, when I design games. I try to think very cinematically. I try to think of, okay, if this is made of a movie, <laughs> how will it look? You know, this is very, very important to me because I think that's how you sell games. So I had a whole thing where, you know, you look in the mirror, uh, and that's why they canceled the reflection, by the way, is that you can sort of see the beast's eyes looking back at you, wanting to devour you. And, and this sort of uh, was thought to be a little bit too weird by the playtesters and a little bit too introspective, and they wanted to just go out and shoot guns and kill people and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll save that for, for later. And, uh, but, but, and I kind of sort of, you know, tone it down a little bit. But that's where a lot of this stuff came from, is out of this sort of desire to, to, to personify a metaphor and to make it sort of a real thing, you know, which I think is what role-playing does really well, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, an, 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 an analogy, you know, her stare was like broken glass. You might read that in a novel. Well, in a role-playing or type game, you can kind of make that, you know, her, her eyeballs really do look like broken glass. And that whatever she looks like breaks, whatever glass she looks like breaks. You know, you can bring these things to life, these metaphors, these analogies. Absolutely. So with, with, with a Bali, and this is what I want to ask you. Now, we know the Bali go all the way back to fourth generation. Now, it's never really revealed where they come from. Well, what, what, what are your ideas there? I know in, uh, I think it was the Blood Wars trilogy, they give a, a heavy uh, nod that it may have been Salat who created the Bali. There may have been, uh, perhaps it was Set who created them. The, the disciplines are very similar. Uh, perhaps it was uh, Cappadocius or Ashur who created them. Like, where... Where, where is that, that kind of idea uh, with you? How, how did you kind of uh, see that? Oh, you know, I, I don't really have much of Sam Bali. Uh, uh, honestly, uh, where, where it came from and out of, I, I, don't have, I don't have clear memories of it. Uh, I think it was in my notes, but I'm pretty sure that someone else did most of the development work on it. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Just uh, so something of interest there. Now, we we saw from you uh, just just a ton of games. I mean, you know, like you said, you were trying to knock one out a year, and I, I don't know if it quite came out that quickly, but you were just knocking these games out. It was uh, shelves that originally just had rifts and Dungeons and Dragons and maybe like a Call of Duty book in the back. 
you know, they just started giving away, and it was the vampire section, the werewolf section, the mage section, uh, so forth. And I think, um, you know, one of one of the books here that, that seemed very the hunters hunted. I, I thought um, it kind of personifies one of the reasons that I think the game was so successful is at the time you could go uh, get a contemporary uh, of this would be like a Dungeons and Dragons um, softcore, complete fighters or something like that. But that book uh, to a teenager, that book was fifteen to eighteen bucks. These were ten dollars. The clan books were ten dollars, and those having that price, you know, when you're when you're a teenager and you got money in your pocket, you're like, well, man, I can get that. I can't I can't afford that that fighters handbook, but damn, I can grab that clan uh, La Sombra handbook right now and go home home with it. So, uh, is that was that really the idea to just sort of get the get the absolute? Because I believe they were the cheapest role playing game books you could get. The the uh, I don't want to call them splat books, but the clan books and a lot of the other books. No, absolutely. It's, it's basically my philosophy always was, you know, more product at lower prices. You know, you know, don't come with these big thick books. Come with lots of little books that are fun and cool and, and give you something new. And you know, and, and my idea always was, you know, give them really fresh, new, cool art to look at. So in the bookstore, you're looking at the cool art. You go, oh yeah, I gotta have this. And you're gonna have some new powers, yeah. And then you're gonna have some new role-playing stuff, and it's all gonna tie into your character or a character you might want to invent, you know. And yeah. so that way, that way, you just sell lots of stuff, and, and and then that's why all the games tied together. So even if you weren't playing mage, you might want to pick up a mage book because maybe the players will fight a mage soon, or maybe you just want to know about mages in case your game master has you fight them. You know, so that you know, it's all this big meta world that everything ties together with. I mean, that was the that was the core concept. It was create this meta world with all these different games, and I knew eventually there'd be twenty different games, and make them all tie together so that you could do anything you want with it. You know, and, and that everyone would want. Some, but no matter what kind of gamer you are, you'd fit in somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you know, that's a very important thing there for World of Darkness um, overall. Now, let, let, let me ask you um, about crossover games. Now, a lot of times crossover games don't work real well in the World of Darkness. The things play at different power levels. They have different reasons to distrust, dislike, or even want to kill each other. Was, was it intended to not have that together, or uh, was the intent... Did, did that come off? How, how did you feel about the way that the crossover games came off? I think that's the best way to ask the question. You mean games where you have one wizard, yeah. one? Yeah, you one. got it. Yeah, uh, originally it was meant to be you could totally do that. And I wanted to have um, a way to do that. I wanted there to be a, a reason why you would do that. I thought it was um, pretty cool to... Uh, <laughs> To be able to uh, have that experience, a little bit cheesy maybe, a little bit too much uh, like, uh, you know, the Avengers or the Super Kids Club, you know, it could get kind of weird, I think. But I did want to do it. But uh, the trouble is, is that the way we organize the company is that each developer of each line had their own fiefdom. So Phil Bricado had his own mage world. Mm -hmm. Uh... And then, you know, the, you have the different werewolf guys and, uh, uh, you know, um, just doing a plug for Phil because the mage is coming out, uh, the 20th anniversary. Uh, and, and basically, you know, they're really busy. They have a train to keep. You know, they'll be fired by this corporate management if they don't get the trains out. So they don't have time to work together, and they don't have any reason to work together. So... The, the, the way we organized the company made it almost impossible to create products that let that happen because each developer had his own kingdom. And in exchange for not paying them much, what we did do is we gave them kind of carte blanche to do what they wanted to, which, you know, is a lot of fun for, for young people. Hey, I'm not getting much money, but I am the master of the mage line or I'm the master of the werewolf line. That's fun for them. And so that was kind of the deal we made. But it made it almost impossible to do these crossover things. And, you know, month by month, they all got further and further apart, and, and you couldn't could sort of bring the pieces back together again. So in, in a way, it was kind of a, you know, you really couldn't put the games together, could you? No. It was very, very 
difficult. It's a question that I'm asking nearly constantly on my channel, and I think that basically, you're, as, you, as you say, is correct to what I tell people. You, you There's some very, very specific cases that you could put things together, but it's almost more of a story. It's like, okay, in this story, these things from these extremely delicate angles, and it's, look, you got to make a character like this. you got to make a character like this. you got to make a character like this. You, you ain't making what you want necessarily because then it's going to go completely to hell. Uh, it's sometimes in some bits you could have some ways to make it work, with time, you know, I certainly could put together a game that worked like that, but the majority of the the absolute worst World Darkness type games you're going to see are games where someone's going, oh, bring whatever you want in. And, yeah. You know, some guys playing. The only way to make it work would be to tell an end of the world story and do it almost like Lord of the Rings. So the end of the world is coming, and this group is banded together because they're the best of the best, and they're following a prophecy. They're going to try and stop the end of the world. You know, it has to be something that be fighting something that's so huge and so big. And then you could maybe do a, you know, a couple year long gaming session because, you know, you're the only ones who can do it. And it's a mythic legendary quest. And, and, and you're brought together and you're given the support of your various teams and peoples because you're all fighting together, you know, the worm or whatever, the, the bad guys. And somehow, you know, um, this section of the werewolves or this part of the of the vampires are banded together to do this. That's the only way to do it. And even then, the rules wouldn't really lend themselves to it, would they? Uh, no, 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 not, not particularly. Uh, Mark, could, could you tell us a little bit about why, why was werewolf number two? Why was that the, first, the second thing you, you told me? Uh, because it was, uh, I figured it would be the second most popular. It was a pure business decision. Also, uh, because I had made the werewolves and uh, vampires antagonistic, uh, I kind of was thinking at the time that, oh, if I do werewolves, that'll give something for the vampires to fight. You know, I st at that point, I still hadn't, I was still worried that people wouldn't, um, wouldn't role play. <laughs> that they would play vampire like D&D &D and they would want dungeons and things to fight and and combat and you know yeah. adventures and stuff I didn't I didn't really I wasn't convinced yet that people would embrace this idea of, of role playing a story and and doing politics and what have you and uh, happily I was uh, my my concerns were unfounded people kind of never wanted to play vampire as a adventure type game. So in, in Werewolf, can you talk about how, how you design the auspices? And um, yeah, I mean, Werewolf was a very interesting, uh, was a very interesting process um, because I was exhausted. I was fried. I mean, I, I had no uh, energy left. I had just come a vampire. I'm trying to get the vampire supplements out. I'm trying to work on everything else. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and it was just very, very tough. I, just, just getting time to work on it was in, in, insanely difficult because I basically had no ability to do to really focus the way I did with Vampire. So I always felt like Werewolf was kind of off the cuff. At the same time, I had an enormous team of people who were willing to help me. <laughs> you know, I remember one meeting we had in the new office. There was like 30 people piled in the room. And I was a young guy at the time. I didn't realize that, you know, I needed two people. <laughs> I needed three people. But I pulled in this group of people because I was hoping to find some people, but it was just a complete, oh, it was terrible. I, I mean, it was just so painful, but, you know, I was really pushing, I was really um, focused because I wanted to make it sort of the, I wanted this to be my true expression of, um, you know, uh, Mercy Aliada and uh, the power of myth and my environmental feelings that I just wanted to go all out. So, you know, the auspices came very early. I mean, obviously, based on the the phases of the moon, 
you know. Uh, and uh, but I've always sort of felt like, you know, having the tribes and the hospices and the medicine and all that kind of stuff, it was maybe a few too many different things. And it, and it kind of, you know, vampire because of his purity of only having clans, in a way it has a better feel because, you know, a character is many, many things, but if you say to someone, oh, I'm a Ventru, they know who you are. And werewolf, you can't really say that, can you? No. There's no, there's no one thing that defines you. And in a way, that's more realistic, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's more real life, but... But it, it's hard. But it, but it's it, it's not as elegant as a game. If, yeah. if I could if I could redo Werewolf, I would edit it down. Now Werewolf is largely a game that it seems almost like a a hybrid of World of Darkness towards like a Dungeons and Dragons type game. You have the pack. You have the easy way to assemble all the characters to point them at things. To reward them with, you know, treasures and so forth. It, it was that was that kind of part of the design you, you were saying there earlier to to kind of bring uh, a game that was more accessible to other people because you know Vampire is not an easy game to run. It takes a lot of talent and a lot of thought and a lot of preparation to be able to to put together the political weave that you need for. That vampire. actually was the big fear of Vampire, by the way, before we came out with it. That was the thing that I expressed to someone. Uh, and then it kind of went around their little company like wildfire. Like, like what if this is the case? What if Vampire is the game that everyone wants to play, but no one can run? <laughs> you know? Like, there's no one. And at that time, this whole storytelling thing was very basic. I mean, some people were playing Troop Style Play Ars Magica, but most people were not pl doing story, t story <laughs> things. I mean, you did have Call of Cthulhu, but even that was very, very easy to run comparatively because, you know, you investigate. It's like a detective story. So you kind of steal a movie plot, a detective movie, and you kind of give them evidence and they're pursuing it, and then they go crazy. You know, it's pretty set. Vampire, we were just terrified. There was no – people would be like, what do we do? How do we run this? What's the story about it? And – the last month, I was just working like crazy to try and give out story ideas and story seeds and, you know, somehow make it easier. But, but in Werewolf, yeah, I mean, I think it's easier to run Werewolf, isn't it? I mean, there's just so much more to sink your teeth into. Well, see, that I, I don't know if I necessarily agree there's more to sink your teeth in. I mean, there's a lot you can do there for sure, but I think overall, if I mean, if you want to run a game that people remember for – years and years and years. I don't think Vampire the Masquerade gives you the tools. You have to really do the work, though. It's not an easy game to run, uh, which I think is its biggest strength and its biggest weakness. With Camarilla games, particularly, a Sabat game is much easier to do because uh, it has that same party mentality, but it involves a lot of ability for people to sit there and be quiet and, and let the story unfold to have uh, around there where, where, where people are doing, you know, they're doing their own thing, having their own story told, their own NPCs and so forth. So uh, overall, I, I think the game, it's a whole different way to play a role-playing game. It's not a party style of game. And I think that intimidates people and, and mesmerizes people to the point that, you know, people are like, oh, God, I got to play a set tide. Oh, God, I got to play this, uh, this Ravnos character or this gang girl that I want to play, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's a... Uh... It uh, pulls you in. Oh, you got a visitor too. Yeah, yeah, no, my, my little guy's here. I had, to, so I had to run over there and grab him from the uh, – <laughs> get him inside. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so we, we talked about the werewolf and the ideas there. Uh, one thing I, I really always liked with werewolf was the fact that they'll actually use silver. You know, they'll use the big silver clay, and I think that's so iconic because they're like – they don't want to like they're it's terrifying to them but at the same time it's it's power is so tremendous that you know they're they're they have to make that that kind of sacrifice and again it goes back to a flaw like okay i have this kick-ass magic sword but it also has a flaw to it so you know yeah i love that idea i remember 
I actually don't think that was my idea, but I do remember hearing it and going, hell yeah, that's totally how it works. You know, that's, that's, that's a, it's a tribal thing. It's like, you know, holding, playing with fire as a kid or jumping over fire in the tribes of New Guinea. You know, I mean, this is a big freaking deal, you know? And I yeah. totally wanted that whole mood in, in, uh, in, um, in Werewolf. I was very obsessed at the time with, with uh, uh, anthropology, you know, going to these uh, uh, Stone Age cultures in the Amazon or in the Philippines and, and what, what, what humans were like, you know, before the trappings of civilization tainted us forever. And I really wanted, uh, you know, these are, these are some, this is a really old, ancient culture, and it's very tribal. And, uh, uh, you know, and I was also inspired by uh, RuneQuest. Uh, RuneQuest has this whole, um, you know, the clans of packs and all this kind of stuff. I mean, RuneQuest really gets into the, the, the clans and the tribes and the different spirits and, and you know, a very Bronze Age feel. And uh, I totally wanted a Bronze Age feel to Werewolf. And I think sort of holding the silver knife up and being in pain... You know, that feels kind of, you know, uh, I think Bronze Age peoples, I mean, they must have been in love with their swords, man. No one ever seen anything like them before. They were, like, fighting with, like, uh, you know, flint-tipped, you know, arrows and, uh, you know, clubs made of trees. And suddenly some dude shows up with a freaking metal sword. Oh, my God, what a talisman that was. People must have flipped the hell out. You know, and, and I, I, I love that feel. And that's what we're really going for in Werewolf. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you definitely can see that, that primitive man aspect of predominantly, I guess, with red talons more than anywhere else. I mean, they are sort of described as, uh, you know, beast-like, you know, like, almost like troglodytic in their in their nature. Um, so uh, I, de I definitely could easily see that. And, and I thought one time of having a running a Werewolf game that kind of told the entire story through the past lives background, that advantage, and, you know, just starting at the very beginning and then just hitting all the key points through the lives of maybe eight and 800 different characters, you know, as it just kind of runs down through the whole uh, melting yeah. point to, to the very end where they ultimately lose. And that's, that's really the great thing with Werewolf is the tragedy, the sadness that they are, they're going to lose. They're doomed, uh, you know, and they're fighting there. And, the fact is they brought it on themselves. You know, they, they, they can't work with each other. Their, their greatest strength, their rage, is, is by far their greatest weakness. You know, ten times over more that they, they just can't, can't deal with others. Let me ask you this. Oh, the, uh, the changing breeds. Now, was any of the changing breeds, was that your idea or that, was that uh, kicked over and someone else came up with those sort of ideas? Uh, what do you mean changing breed? Changing breeds like a Nuisha or Rokia or Macaulay, something like that. Oh, oh, I, uh, I don't remember who came in up, up with that, so it may not have been me. <laughs> how, how do you think that came across? Like, it, it had, it was kind of odd. It felt almost a little disjointed in the fact that there's only a few. There was like, well, there's these animals. And a lot of times it seemed, it seemed almost grasping at straws as to say, well, okay, there's these, but not other things. There's um, not a... It seems like an idea that was started and it wasn't quite finished to, to bring it to the kind of fruition that you'd really need to with to really put over the idea of, of changing breeds as a game. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's one of those things that was really uh, wanted by the fans, but wasn't really built in. You know, I think I had a kind of a vague idea that you could do it, and I kind of wanted to work it in. But I never actually, because Werewolf is so rushed, you know, it was just so difficult to write Werewolf. It was just really a nightmare. So, um, uh, it was just so busy, you know. We're riding this enormous wave of vampire, and like suddenly, oh, you got to write Werewolf. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. So, so it didn't have the advantage of, you know, having enough focus. So I, I think, you know, if I could redo it, I would re work the breeds in a little differently, you know. But, but you know, role-playing games are never perfect and they're never done. 
Oh, sure, sure. What about the, uh, we talked about the elegant style of the vampire cover. The werewolf cover is very different. On the first print, it comes across very different than the second one with the big gouge rin slash marks inside the cover on that second edition. Now, me, when I, when I saw that, I went, whoa. You know, I mean, it drew your eye from anything on the shelf if if the books were facing outwards. As a one game star, yeah. you know? Or if your friend showed it to you, you'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> Yeah, no, I remember going to uh, Richard Thomas and going, uh, this is what I want. And Richard, to his credit, to his eternal credit, was like, let me see if that's even possible, but that's cool. And everyone else was like, that's crazy, that's crazy. You don't cut holes in a book. You know, people don't want holes in their book. You know, that's terrible. And I go, that's why we didn't do it with a soft paperback, because that would ruin their book and they'd hate it. You know, you know but the hardback... It's perfect. I think or we did do it with a soft back. I forget. It was the hard back you did it with. The soft back had like little green lines. It was the same sort yeah, of design. Same idea, but yeah. But, but, I, but I want to do the in the soft back and get a plastic coat, and it was so tough that it wouldn't rip. Yeah. We couldn't do it. So we had to do the thing. So the hard back, I was like, Richard, I don't care what it costs. I need holes in it. And uh, he figured it out. Well, the great thing is the color artwork you have right behind it. That's what made it. Because you could see a little part of the color artwork, and then you're sucked in. You have to open up. You have to have a look. Yeah. yeah. I think the thing is that, that, you know, I really try to hire people who, like me, love the art of printing books. You know, and I just love printing. I love paper. I love the smell of paper. I love books. You know, I have a huge library still even though now I'm reading almost everything on my iPad. Um, but I love books, and, and I'm really sad. They're kind of going away. But, you know, I don't think cards are going anywhere, you know, so that goes back to why I'm now doing this card game. And, uh, and for the game this summer, we're going to be using, probably using uh, cards for characters, you know, because I, I think not collectible, <laughs> but, but cards that you can basically – pick out cards to sort of create a character from, uh, or at least a big part of your character. And I think that's really important uh, to, to have something that that is tactile and paper-based. I love paper. Well, I think that's a great point you brought up there. Not collectible cards, because, Lord, that, that would be that would be, be a, a horrible thing for, for a role-playing game to, to, to bring about as it, as it would just create such a huge sort of imbalance and it would just kind of feed into the wrong direction, but it would, it, would, it would completely be a D and D kind of game, wouldn't it? You know, it'd be, uh, uh, you know, if, if uh, you had to be rich to have a to have a vorpal blade. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It Imagine would. that. You're like, oh boy, look at I got stuff for my character out of this this pack for three ninety nine. Yeah. Oh, uh, the, the idea is that basically you can give, uh, you know, let's say. Um, you know, as a group, you buy two decks of cards, so everyone has to create their basic beginning characters out of this set of 100, and 100 cards. Um, a new player comes, you go, here's the cards no one's chosen yet. So pretty much, you're guaranteed that your character is going to be completely different from all the characters. Because, you know, and it's very, very simple, you know, with the basic sets, uh, the character points are all the same. They're all two-point cards. So you just say, pick ten cards, and that's your basic character, you know? And you see the pictures, you see the names, you don't worry about the rules. You just pick the archetypes you like. I think that's going to be a, for me, this is like my ideal way to make a character. This is like a very cool thing. But it certainly seems like it would flow, and like you could just kind of get your base. I'm guessing that kind of creates your base, and then you sort of add on your, your ideas from that, not in terms of power, but in terms of, you know, personality. and Absolutely. I, I think you still will write things down, and, yeah. and we, we're definitely going to have a whole uh, like a database, a website, where you create your, you can add in all your details, your character on the, on the, on the database, and then we'll, we'll keep that for you. And then other people, depending on their powers of uh, Arcanos, mythos and perception can access different levels of information about your character. Cano's mythos and perception right there. He's, he's teasing you folks. He's giving you a little bit more of an in-look. <laughs> so pay attention to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that's very interesting. Dude, there's certainly the fires of all I understood with the ideas that you're putting out here. Certainly sounds 
No, I'm so excited, by the way. To, to, you know, I love board games. I'm a huge uh, board game fan. Uh, just like I am a MMO fan. I love all games. I love all games. But coming back to role-playing is just so much fun. I love it. I'm just so happy to be back in the... It's just, you know, it makes me happy. Uh, it's what I do best. So it's what I want to do. Sure. Well, that's wonderful, Mark. And I think, uh, you know, that that's, that's really a great place to, to conclude here, the fact uh, of this new game is going to be putting out, and we are going to be bringing you here on your main man's channel. Some more details as they become available for the general consumption about exactly what, what this game is going to be about. Now, also, go check it out. I'm going to be posting the link here in just a few minutes for Succubus the Reborn. Go check the Kickstarter out, see how you get involved. Kickstarter now. That's right. See how, how you get involved. Help me out, babies. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Make make uh, Mark, make make it a lot easier for Mark to bring this next game to you. Fund this project, get it going, get it uh, really pop it up so that he's he's going to be able to continue to stay around. He's going to be able to uh, uh, really invest his time and energy in putting this next game out. That I'm sure each and every one of you out there is just chopping at the bit to get a hold My of. My kids got to eat. Yeah, his kids have to eat, so let's make sure that they eat and eat well. Uh, so get out there, uh, pledge what you can to the Kickstarter, and get involved with, with, with this new game. And certainly anyone that wants to, uh, once you get the product, do reviews of it, do reviews of Succ Succubus uh, Reborn, and you know, let, let's, let's hear what you have to say. Well, what do you think about the game, how it plays? Give us you know, your stories or even footage of, uh, of, of that coming across. It would be very interesting to see. Well, Mark, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate you coming on to my show and, and giving us this great detailed interview. We went all around the world of darkness. We went into the real-life world of darkness of Hollywood. Uh, you're a wonderful guest, and I uh, appreciate you being here. Everyone, go check out the Kickstarter, Succubus, and stay tuned for more details on what's to come. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. And uh, bye, everyone.